Hello, everybody. Uh, John Sviokla here. I'm delighted to be with my dear friend, uh, Dixon Chu. We're going to talk about payments and the frictionless economy and so forth. <coughs> I'm going to give you a bit of, <coughs> excuse me. I'm going to give you a bit of Dixon's background in just a minute here. Um, welcome back to Growth Innovators. Um, what we're going to do here is we'll have a conversation with Dixon. If you have uh, questions or so forth, please feel free to put them in the chat, and we'll try to get to, to those questions as we go along. Um, and our purpose here at Manifold and Growth Innovators is really to figure out what are the different dimensions of growth that you can help um, put your organization on the path toward, or if you're making investments, what are the right folks to invest into? So let me give you a little bit of background for uh, Dixon. Dixon's a dear friend, and um, he probably is the most informed person that I know of on the planet in terms of payments. I mean, he started out, uh, he's had experiences at Wells Fargo, Yahoo Payments, PayPal, Citibank, Living Social on the Merchant Solutions side. He's a principal at DC Advisors, which I think was his own company. He was a, a member of, the, of, of uh, the board of advisors for Loop Pay, Confirm IO, which was another identity uh, organization um, to do with payments, with Cortex, which is another uh, backbone for digital transactions. Uh, then he spent time at BBVA and ran a, uh, one of the divisions called Simple, which was uh, Think of it as kind of Acorn, an Acorn competitor, if you will. Uh, he was a member of uh, the board of directors of Boomtown, which was, you know, better for uh, community involvement and so forth. Ingo Money, Bluefin Payments, and now is CEO of Copper. So Dixon, as I say, you know, as the old saying goes, he's uh, well, he's forgotten more about payments that, than most people will ever know. And, uh, and the other th cool thing about having Dixon is that, he is that rare combination of both a visionary as well as super duper practical. Um, and that's a rare combo. And uh, so Dixon, lovely to have you here. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you for the kind words. Um, I hope I can live up to it in this conversation. But, you know, just uh, to paraphrase the guy from the farmer's insurance commercial, well, I know a few things as I've seen a few things. So hopefully <laughs> I can try to share, share some of that. Yes. Excellent. Well, um, let me go ahead and just let, uh, uh, our agenda here, um, gives you some of the background. So we're going to be looking at what the digital payment system ecosystem is evolving into customer loyalty and rewards programs. Cause, um, one of the beautiful things about payments is you have to make them. And so it's an opportunity for engagement. And then really what the, uh, you know, uh, customer relationship might look like over time uh, as folks do that. And in addition, we may uh, spend a little bit of time on crypto and alternative payments mechanisms. So I mentioned to you that the chat is open. Please feel free to drop anything in there. And um, <clears throat> the uh, I just want to remind folks of a core thing. Um, that we really think that the, the, the world is being becoming disrupted because more and more stuff is being computable. And we'll get to this. Some of the payment stuff is computable, cognition, transactions, and so forth. So this is yet another vector into the notion that, uh, you know, we're really about a new economy that's based on the fact that it's not only a physical world, but a computable world, which is a combination of, level, of knowledge and understanding and digitization together equals computability. So... Um, you know, Dixon, as you look at the, you know, payment system uh, and loyalty programs and so forth, but especially the digital payments ecosystem, there's so much activity and so much going on. How do you look at it in terms of, you've obviously got a beautiful arc of, you know, understanding and experience in it, in terms of where are we, you know, and, and, and what's, what are the important trends executives need to understand? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> you know, as, you know, and probably most of the audience, a lot of investment money have gone into what is now coined as fintech. I mean, when sure. I was doing this some time ago, it was just usually just emerging payments or emerging technology or whatever. But you know, now it's a category, right? Um, and and you know, the, all that funding makes sense. It's gone in and. Little little changes have happened over, the, let's say, the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. But I think the important part is, well, let's pay attention to those little changes 
and how do they actually start to influence um, what's going on in the industry? So it is an evolution, right? There is no, um, there is no sudden disruption that's going to happen, and it hasn't happened, right? Um, but we're, in some ways, just to answer your question, I characterize it. Ironically, I, I still think it's actually fairly early days, right? In terms uh-huh. of um, you know this category of digital payments. Now, of course, ironically, isn't you know since the invention of Visa and you know the idea that you're going to present some numbers to someone on a card and then that right. is a token for value. Mm-hmm. Well, isn't that the original digitalization? You're no longer handing pieces sure. of paper or whatever else. And so, in in many ways, I mean, since the 1950s, you could you could say that all payments is digital, right, right. for the most part. But I think what's happened is it's evolved. E-commerce certainly changed a lot of things. I mean, I yeah. have the great honor of being part of PayPal, where during the early days of e-commerce, and we were we our mission was to empower people who want to sell online to safely accept and send payments. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know that grew over time. And now a lot of these things, um, I think consumers just sort of take for granted, right? The evolution that came out of there, you know, you've got it moved to mobile with the likes of Venmo and, you know, all sorts of people of all age categories use Venmo. Mm-hmm. Um, and the banks got involved and they said, hey, wait, we want a piece of this action. Why don't we right. do something? There was a, we own the rails. So right. we could transfer and then. Um, it was a couple of evolutions later, but then we ran in and evolved as, as something we now know as Zelle. Yes. Okay, so that's another digital, purely um, digital way of um, sending money person to person. Sure. And of course, they're going to evolve. I mean, it, the person to person thing is interesting and it, it changes behavior in some ways. Or it gets into the vernacular, but it doesn't make any money. Yes. So it'll be a matter of time before Zelle starts to get into the merchant acceptance business where small business can use it just like they're accepting a card, they can accept sell and they'll have to, you know, pay a big for that. Right. Just, Mm -hmm. or in the industry with a merchant discount. Yes. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I I know you and I were talking about, um, you know, why you thought we're kind of at the early days of all this. And could you just explain a little bit, you, you know, when you laid out, gee, where are the, where are the fees and transactions and, you know, what kind of legacy stuff, just so we have a baseline yeah. for, for the audience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I mean, sp- banking and payments go together. Um, you know, it's interesting. I've spent time in both. Um, if you talk to 10, 15, 20 years ago, you talk to bankers, they didn't want to be involved in the payments business because, you know, it's a, it's a business of nickels. You're mm-hmm. stringing a lot of nickels together. It's not interesting. It's very operational, and it's kind of that dirty back office stuff. It's not as sexy as you know the banker trying to sell loans and whatnot. Then all of a sudden, you know those cycles change, and all of a sudden they realize, hey, you know, you string enough of those nickels together, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a lot of money, <laughs> and it's and it's persistent, right? Um, but you know, the reason that a lot of change happens in this industry and then there are all these all this investment of people trying to get involved is um the the, the underlying value chain is really kind of this is is in some ways tightly controlled yes but it's also very opaque mm-hmm. right? right um you know I, I think the example you and i were chatting about is like hey, why 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 is it that um accepting a car payment is so expensive particularly in the u.s we're the lar- we're the most expensive interchange um country in the world really interesting um whereas some of the other countries say australia they've regulated it it's, there's a cap and that's happening in a, a few other places in europe as well right whereas in the u.s um it is the most expensive country for accepting a car payment um but the the thing that it, that the sales folks in the, in the industry have done is They've, they've created a way to distract the consumer or the buyer of the service by saying, oh, well, you know, there's a swipe fee and, you know, we can't control that. That's the issuing bank and that's Visa and MasterCard and the networks. And yeah. everyone thinks about it as like some percentage. I think, you know, in a common way, most right. people will say, well, you know, well, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only paying 2% for my card transaction or one and a half. 
Atlanta or whatever it is. <laughs> um, the the real dirty little secret is if the merchants ever bother to actually look at their their month end statement. It's yes. like the old the phone bills we used to get a gazillion years ago, right? Sure. Where you know supposedly you signed up for a thirty nine ninety five a month plan, right? But then how come every month is sixty five dollars? Yeah, you're right. right? And right. then you realize there are all these fees that are tacked on and so forth. Sure. And so that 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 is a prevalent behavior in the payments business, and that's because there are a lot of different hands in that pocket, right? Certainly, there's interchange, which right. is really what the issuing bank that issue that card gets paid. That's their revenue. Right. Well, you know, the networks, whether it's Visa, MasterCard, or whoever else, um, they're going to charge something for moving the data around, right? Their network. Right. But then they've, they've tacked a whole bunch of other fees um, in there, you know, the category being assessments and fees. You put that together, you can't really control it. But then um, you've got the, the machinery that does the processing and the accounting and all that, right? Uh, right. Otherwise, uh, it's the big processors, right? Right. Priceserve, WorldPay, you know, global payments. And of course, they need to get paid. Um, and so they tax some fees on top for the processor fee. Yes. Now you've got this incredibly elongated sales channel of direct sales to channel sales, so agents on the ground and so forth. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this, John, but um, in the U.S., there's something like 200,000 humans on the ground, on the street, selling credit card payments, credit card processing. Wow. <laughs> right? wow. you know, That's a big sales force. Yeah. Well, they're independent agents mostly, um, and then that works its way up. It's almost like a big, you know, multi-level marketing kind of scheme, right? So mm -hmm. of course each one along the way, as as you know, as you know, as that value chain it, it, it gets elongated, everyone has a piece of that, and they tack something else on. So um, so that's sort of the fee structure. At the end of the day, the merchants in there go, oh, "Gee, I'm I'm just trying to accept this card. Sure, it's convenient. My consumer wants to use it, and um, and you know what? I yeah, I have to pay something for it. Yes, oh, boy, those fees just keep going up." Right. Yeah. Um, and then, and, and so there's a whole bunch of these nuances that at the end of the day, the consumer has some benefits. They get all kinds of rewards. I like to use the reward cards, they have the benefit sure. of convenience and security of uh, card payment. Right. And, but you know, the merchant is bearing the brunt of it. Right. Um, sure. And so the investments in a bunch of startups is all about hey, how do we create some efficiency along the line of that, that value chain? Yes. You know, I mean, I'll give you the, the, the merchant statement example I just gave, right? Yeah. There's actually a little cottage industry of businesses that say, hey, send me your merchant statement and I'll analyze and then tell you where you're getting screwed or where you, you can save money. Sure. Now, of course, that's just cover for and buy, buy it from me because I can save you some money. So, right. so um, you know, it's it, it, it is a it is an overall evolution that will continue. All the while, though, interestingly, the cost of payments keeps going up, which which you would think, like, based on all the innovation and technology, yeah. it could go down, but it hasn't, right? If you track the interchange in the U.S. and the cost of payments in the U.S., um, pretty consistently every couple of years it goes up. I mean, it, it, it seems that it's not, it does, it's not following the free market dynamics that you would normally think of. Well, yeah, I mean, it depends, you know, if, if it's a complex oligopoly, you know, that's highly regulated. Yeah. A, a lot of times, you know, prices go up. I mean, you look at, um, you know, you look at certain drugs and so forth, you would expect like um, there's, a, there's a drug uh, for multiple sclerosis, uh, Copaxone, which is an amino acid you have to take every day. And Tiva owns it. And then they bought the generic and they priced the generic. Just um, it's 56 grand a year for the branded and 45 grand a year for the generic, you know, it's just a, you know, whatever, right? The, yeah. uh, no, it's, it's fascinating. I remember when you, you and I were talking the, when I first took uh, the industry and competitive analysis course from Mike Porter, the famous, you know, um, uh, business strategy academic mm -hmm. and uh, in his book, competitive strategy, which was the first of his three kind of masterworks. Um, the, uh, the, I, I was, <clears throat> sitting in his class in the spring of 1982 and he the first case he taught to make the point of the importance of industry structure was the rockwell water meter case 
because mm -hmm. that division had a return on investment of over 70 percent because the structure the industry structure was so favorable to profitability and it sounds like we might have a similar thing here right that the big process i mean certainly visa and you know mastercard their stock prices have been unbelievable you know yeah. in terms of you know their market capitalization um so fascinating, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a contrarian when all these people are talking about, you know, decentralized finance and stuff like that. It's like, eh, maybe for a small part of the market, but, you know, I mean, a small part of the finance market's huge. I'm not saying that it could be trillions, but, yeah. it, but it's not, a, it's not anywhere near even a significant minority, never mind majority. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah. I mean, it is the case where, um, to, you know, to kind of use the term, that from, from an article you pointed me to that you wrote on kind of this whole notion of dematuring industries. Yes. I mean, yes, the, the banking and payments industry is kind of dematuring, but boy, it's going to take a long, long time. Now, the oh, question okay. is, if you're sitting in, in the uh, seat of a senior manager there, and I've been in both places, I've been a startup and I've been a managing director at one of the world's largest banks. Sure. Okay, well, do you react? What do you do? Right. I think, you know, it starts with you, you need to be constantly on the lookout, like, and paying attention and trying to string things together. Yes. Hey, this change just happened. Is it near term, midterm, long term, in terms of implications? And sure. what does that mean? And it's that whole sort of constant decision making and the scenario plan that needs to happen, right? Because yeah. at the end of the day, um, you know, while it's sexy to talk about how small and fast will be big and slow, yes, um, big got big because of things they may have done over time, and they're banking on a couple of things. One, they've got all the capital. Right. Small needs capital to be able to challenge them. Two, they're big and they're they might be slow, but part of that slowness has to do with the fact that, particularly in financial services, you count on something incredibly powerful. You count on inertia of your customer's behavior. For sure. Right. Most most customers just, they can't be bothered. It takes a lot to shift them to sure. change their behavior, right? And, and in some ways, whether they explicitly know it or not, CEOs of large banks and all that, I mean, understand that. Um, sure. So they actually want to keep things kind of slow. Yeah, of course. And then you've got all the political lobbying as well, right? So they're... Yeah. I, I believe it's still true that financial services, pharma, and tech are, are the three top lobbyists in terms of dollars spent and bodies on the ground. I, and, I think that sounds right. Yeah, pharma pharma has three lobbyists for every member of Congress. <laughs> so there you go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well. Yeah, that, that matters. When you're in a highly regulated business, that matters, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, interesting, you know, um, w one of the things I think that's that's kind of cool is the, you know, where you are now at Liven and yeah. and my understanding of Liven, right? You have the three hunks, right? You've got your copper division, you've got a loyalty program, and then you've got uh, content, dynamic content management. Is that correct? Those are right. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a very that's a the content and marketing piece is is sort of tied to um, uh, the loyalty platform. We also have some transactional business. We have an uh, online ordering and ordering a table business, and we own a point of sale company. Yes. Um, but the uh, the the interesting thing about Liven and how copper fits into it, but you know, talking about Liven is, um, I mean, I was attracted to to it and why you know we ended up merging ourselves into them because it together I think we can be like exponentially bigger. But yes. it definitely has a lot of sort of PayPal-esque characteristics to it, right? Essentially, we're creating a currency or, you know, let's not use those words. Some regulator might be listening to this webcast. Right. We're creating a token that's a, yeah. that's a proxy for store value, right, that consumers buy. And then they can use that token at different merchants. Um, now, what we've done that's um, that's pretty interesting because if you take a step back in terms of the the history or the um, yeah of loyalty program. Actually, Dixon, just before you hop to the history, just to to be clear, so I and and Liven's big in Australia, right? So I yeah. go in and I can I can either buy basically the point version of a gift card, so I can go to yeah. you know Krispy Kreme and you know. Yeah buy 10,000 points and give it to somebody or keep it yep. myself and I get a discount on yep. that. 
and or I can buy a live in currency, which I then can spend across live in merchants. Is that correct? Um, partially. Right now, we, we don't sell the network currency. We actually issue it as a bonus. Right. So let's say, yes, use your Chris Dream example. Chris yeah. here says, hey, I want to build um, loyalty among my consumers. In fact, in the language of Ivan, we help them build fans. Well, yes. I'm a fan of this brand. Right. And so the brand um, says, hey, I'm going to um, reward that fandom, that loyalty, um, by giving you a discount um, as a way to get you going of um, brand dollars that you can spend with me. Right. So let's say a classic example would be, hey, prepay 20 and I'll give you 20. So right. it's a little bit like the Starbucks app, which is the most, you know, world, most successful example of that, right? You got this app, you go to pay with the app and you basically pre-funded it. So what's the, what, what is a better expression of loyalty than I'm willing to put money down in advance of me consuming the good right. because I know I'm going to come back. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's the core mechanics of what we do. But then on top of that, every time you go in and transact, will bonus you, the consumer, some some bonus dollars that you can use at any of the locations that is in the live and network. Right. Um, and there's a sort of network effect that happens, right? I mean, sometimes merchants will say, well, why am I helping you uh, fund dollars for my consumer to go spend somewhere else? Yes. Well, except, well, keep in mind, someone else is also funding it and that consumer is coming back to you. Sure. And what we're trying to generate is a local community effect of the consumer saying, okay, well, I've got these dollars. I can yeah. spend it in this community. Why that would be my first choice as I think about where to spend. Right. I mean, you and I were talking about this idea, like, okay, well, that's kind of cool. Um, well, let, let's take it to something more practical, right? Small town USA. Right. Like it's very popular that once a year talk about shop local and all right. this sort of thing. But let's put some teeth into it. Let's say right. that the population that is there in small town USA yes. is equipped with dollars, tokens that they can only shop, they can only spend, and they're rewarded for that within the the community of merchants in their sure. small group. Yes. Right. So that creates a little local ecosystem, a local currency and economy. Um, and so that's 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 what we're trying to do. In some ways, I mean loyalty has been around forever, right? I mean, all sure. the way back to like H&S green stamps and punch cards and that right. sort of thing. Sure. Um, by being able to digitize it, you just are able to have a lot more creative um, applications of it. And then, of course, in the app, we do the thing, do different things around uh, gamification. Hey, yeah. Do these five things and you'll get a bonus. Um, right. Do these other things and you'll get something else. And then we're playing around with crypto. So some of the merchants actually have NFTs. So they'll say, Hey, can we set up a thing where if, if John comes back 10 times, right, he's going to get access to this specific N NFT that, that he can only right. get from me. Right. Like that becomes the real expression of fandom, right? Yes. Hey, you're not just a customer. You're not just a repeat customer. You're a fan of that brand. Right. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to facilitate. Yeah, I remember my youngest son when he was young was a huge fan of the Coke brand. And when I'd go on business trips around the world, you know, he had a collection of like 40 yeah. different kinds of Coke cans, right? The, um, and um, no, it's, it's fascinating. And, and the, 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 that effect, that local effect, I mean, all the data and it says that people say that, to your point, they, they say they want to, but do we really have teeth in it? And then, you know, I know that uh, uh, Gallup was working with Walmart and um, they proved that that if you live within 20 miles of a Walmart, uh, your uh, the average American household saves about $3,300 a year shopping at Walmart. What mm -hmm. they don't what they don't say is that downtown has been decimated, and you know, sure, yeah, like all the all the local stuff has been just blown out. Um, right. And we actually did an analysis that looked at okay, if you were to have, if you were to shop local with this kind of horizontal currency, if you think of it that way, yep. uh, you could save almost the entire amount from the Walmart effect by more efficient marketing. Yep. Uh, Cause small businesses spend eight to 10% on marketing. And if you, you know, if you figure that this would be a, a, a cheaper way to do customer acquisition and retention, then 
you know, that, that turns out to be a thousand, two thousand bucks a household. Precisely. And, um, well, and, and the part where, where the marketing is sufficient is it's not like broad based ads and things that you always, you can't track attribution and things right. like that. I mean, the beauty of wallets and, you know, things being digital mm -hmm. is the consumer has a, a wallet that's right. carrying that currency which means we can communicate in app or by email or other things. Sure. And we can, you know, we help the merchant track that, yes, I'm ran this campaign and went to all the people who are my fans or, or who have some, um, some degree of fanness. Um, but I know I can have attribution because they responded, they came and spent, you sure. know, it has that, has that a little bit of that closed loop notion. Yeah, and it's absolutely. Way, way more efficient marketing spend if you think of it that way. Sure. Hey, to go back to you, so you're just about to say um, a, a while ago, you're about to say, "Hey, if you think about the evolution of loyalty systems," and then I yeah. start to, to oh, get. Oh yeah, started. yeah, yeah. Well, I think we kind of talked about it. I was just going to characterize it and, and sort of, you know, I mean, by and large, there are two models of loyalty, right? There's the brand specific, right, which is what we understand the most extreme and successful is like the Starbucks brand, right? You know, wouldn't you? Like I've got money in my Starbucks app, you know, I'm in San Francisco. So there are all kinds of other, um, Phil's coffee and uh, peas sure. and so forth. Boy, you know, if it were actual money, that's fluid. I should be able to spend it somewhere else. Right. Sure. But, right. but it's fan specific. The other, the other side of it is the coalition loyalty program, which interestingly, um, have been tried many times and failed many times. Yes. Most I would say the most extreme example or an expensive failure would be a few years ago, Amex launched something called Plenty. Okay. And, and you know, in, in their own, in their wisdom, they said, okay, we're going to pick one brand per vertical that you can spend with Plenty. Right. Um, I don't know why someone down at Vesey Street in, in, in New York didn't figure out that that really restricts the utility and perceived value for a consumer who has plenty. So sure. I can only go to this home improvement store right. or this brand because they signed up with you as a deal. So, right. so anyway, but the idea of a coalition is kind of what we were talking about with the small town. Right. What our platform does is we took those two ideas and said we can do either or both. So it's a brand specific coin token yeah. at the same time, if let's use the small town or use a shopping mall. Yes. In fact, we're having a conversation now with a, a big shopping mall owner that said, Hey, um, how about, can you create something for me where I'll fund part of it or all of it, or mm -hmm. I fund it with part of the, the tenants in the shopping mall, a currency for the consumer, and they can only use it in my mall. Right. right? So that's a coalition of that mall. Right. And then if, if some merchant says, hey, look, I'm willing to kick in a little bit more mm -hmm. and I want some restrictions around it and have that be used with us only, we can do that. So that's sort of the interesting power of this evolution of the live and platform uh, compared to like previous, you know, previous models. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think, too, that it's probably worth just describing what Copper does, because I think that's a to me, that was an amazing innovation to in a place I wouldn't have thought of to, to free the information that was flowing, you know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it is hard at, at, this, at its most basic, um, Copper's a internet of things platform and the, the, the edge device as they call it is what, you know, what sits at the end at, at, you know, the physical space. What we did was we took, we embedded a single chip computer that talks Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Well, we didn't invent it. We, got these parts, custom operating system and all that, but we encased it in a, in what looks like a printer cable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you say, well, wh why is that? Well, because the problem we were trying to solve is the point of sale industry um, and the payments industry, and this is where it starts to come together, mm -hmm. has always been very proprietary, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they think about uh, the moats that they build in order yes. to protect their franchise. Right. Except that, you know, as is always the case, the moat doesn't just keep competitors out. It also traps your customer in. Right. So you're a merchant using point of sale brand X. Two things are going to happen. Right. If point of sale brand says, oh, we're, we're going to give you the features that we think you need. 
Right. If you want other ones, you have to get in line and you go through a whole development cycle and so forth. Right. Um, and then the ones that are bigger starts to have create interesting restrictions like, oh, um, you want to do some analysis based on your sales data. Right. We'll let you do that if you pay us an extra for the for the sales analysis module. Right. I mean, when you think about it, like if I'm the yeah. customer, you're, you're telling me I have to pay you to see my own data. Right. Right. So, so it, it's some of those kind of frustrations that we keep hearing and that I've seen for 30 years now in the market. Um, and by the way, that point of sales um, software provider also probably has a cozy relationship with some payments provider. So you're sitting there and you're paying a certain payments rate and you're saying, hey, I can, someone just pitched me and they can save me a ton of money. Sure. The POS guy says, uh, yeah, but we don't support that brand, right? Right. Leaving out the part, we don't support that brand because I'm getting a kickback from the, the sure. guy that I do support. Yes. Right? So, so what we were trying to do is break through all that to basically give that small business, that merchant, you know, just a little more breathing room, as you know, our man in the White House would say. Yeah. You know? Um and and so what we did was we said, Hey, you know, you've got this closed loop system, yep. but the one vulnerability is um, you have to print stuff. You have to print receipts. You have to print reports, and right. so um, and the printing can't be controlled. You have to actually conform to the protocol of the printer company. Right. So what our device is is like a little man in the middle that is capturing all the data that comes out of the point of sale. And now, when you have the data, you can do all kinds of interesting analysis. Then you can also control the transaction, the payment event. And so that's that's kind of what we put together. Um, what's interesting is, you know, it's been, you know, it's been a let's just say it's been a rough ride entering the restaurant industry with a great payment solution that I just described right at the beginning of COVID. <laughs> so, so, so other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, right? That was the point. Yeah, exactly. Other than that, it's, it's great. But um, actually, um, I would say. In in less than a year, and this is kind of if you if you know anything about you know the whole patent process, um, we've been fully issued three patents in less wow. than twelve months. Good for you. So at least the PTO thinks that there's something unique here that we've invented. Yeah. So now it's about getting the right capital partner. Now that we're part of one a large much larger company, to right in that to light. Now tied together, why was Liven interested in us? Well, if you're a loyalty company. Sure. It's all about data. Like yeah. I want to know, not that John ate here. I want to know at the line item, what did he consume so sure. that I can start to develop a more customized, personalized profile for him. Right. Now, the only way that they were able to do it is they run around to every POS company and say, hey, please, can I integrate to you? And half of them will say, no, I don't do that. The other half will say, sure, it's going to cost you this much money. It'll take you this much time. Sure. Whereas with us, with a 10 minute change to dump printer cable with our, with our copper smart cord, you know, we're capturing line item information, you know, transaction level information, at, you know, for every receipt. And that starts to feed the, uh, the, the, the data engine to create just better offers. Yeah. Well, I'd love to, if I remember right, uh, Dixon too, the, 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 the point of sale industry in the U.S. anyway is relatively fragmented, right? And the but the printer uh, device that those point of sales go into is pretty concentrated, right? You just, I think you said there are two major providers, Epson, and I forget the second one. Starmachronics. Yes. Do I remember that right? That once like there's dozens of point of sale and there's two printers. Yeah, more than dozens. I mean, the U.S. Um, just serving restaurants alone, there's yes. over 120 different for sale brands. Wow. So, I mean, the, the genius of saying, OK, well, we can come in on the concentrated end, on the printer end, I thought was was pretty, pretty fun. Um, yeah. And then and then you can just broadcast that information out to the uh, restaurant owner, store owner, whomever. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. We. Um, we, you know, as part of the service, we give them some simple analysis that um, they would otherwise um, have a hard time getting or they would have to have staff and so forth. And it's never real sure. time. But 
since we're capturing this data and it's real time, well, we, we do a couple of things that, that's part of the, the information part to arm the customer, the, the, uh, the merchant. So we can tell them at any, in any hour, what were your sales and compare right. it to any previous period. So you right. can look at a little trending. Um, we can look at it on an aggregate basis, but you know, um, if you're the restaurant general manager on the floor, you're saying, Hey, it's Friday night, six o'clock. How, how are my sales doing versus last week? More importantly, then we give them, Oh, what are your top sellers right now versus last week? Sure. Boy, um, you know, we're not moving a lot of desserts. So I can start to make some decisions about tell the staff, hey, start pushing, you know, cross selling desserts or, you know, it's great. They're buying this special, but, you know, let's let's get them to buy some alcohol since it's high margin and things like that. So we arm them with, with just a real simple dashboard that they can just have a look at. Um, and that's, you know, for us, it was easy to do. But for many people, that's not even accessible. You know, it's so interesting. The um, the very first management information systems course at Harvard Business School, and I taught in that. And uh, the very first case of the very first course was on Mrs. Fields cookies. And the uh -huh. reason was is to show the power. And they had a system that did a lot of the things you're just saying. Hey, it's two o'clock on Tuesday. They also had weather integrated. It was all proprietary yeah. to them. You know, hey, it's going to be hot out. Here's what sells in a hot. Here's the kind of cookies that sell in a hot environment versus a cold one. You know. Um, and um, staffing, they also did staffing. They did uh, promotional activities. Hey, now it's time to go out and give away some, you know, cookie samples, that kind of stuff. Um, and they could close the books every night and see where they were and they could manage during the day, you know, yeah. the operational cycle. And the, the, the fundamental idea that we, we, we were promoting with that case is the idea that the system changes the organization's capability. And that timing wise, with a lot of automation, if you think of a management system as vertical and an operational system as horizontal, yep. that what happened with technology is a lot of times the horizontal piece, the operational piece got faster, but the management system was still slow. Yeah. And so the yeah. idea was to, if you could bring the organization back into sync, you would actually have a competitive advantage because you'd be operationally faster and managerially faster. Uh, yeah. And, and just, uh, you know, in the, in the military sense of the OODA loop, you know, uh, observe, orient, decide, act. Right, the the thing from yeah. Colonel Boyd, that your OODA loop would be faster and better than the competition. You know, we hope so. Yeah, early days. But early yeah, days. That, that's the, um, I don't know about early days. That was 1990, baby. We oh no no no, no. we're trying to, <laughs> we're trying to do those early days. But no, I totally. You know, I mean, look, you know what what's old is new again, or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah well we got some reaction here in the in the thing well, first of all nancy says hello gordon says hello she hasn't oh she's uh she's in the audience good to see you nancy as well and then uh Brett Peterson saying that uh he was working with a, a place doing old movies and you know how do you match that to capability you know yeah. on that idea could you um talk about the, the one of the things that's always amazing about loyalty systems is um how well they work when they when they when they're designed properly and 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 from my perspective how irrational people can be you know i mean i you know i i you know i'd hear from executives sometimes you know who added a leg to their trip because they'd get you know more points or they'd stay in their thing and you know <clears throat> i would do the math on what i guess their salary was and i said well you know for those points you just priced your time at basically three orders of magnitude less than you get paid you know right. so what, what are you doing I mean, what do you mean you added a leg to get you know you'd be nuts yeah but i mean it's so what do you what do you see happening why do you think that's the case and kind of where do you see it evolving um well you know uh i'm not an expert in loyalty by any means but i would just say as a casual observer people like deals yeah and so i mean i spent a little time living social as you mentioned and yep you know boy there was a time period people like deals right yeah, yeah, and sure. so and so it does lead to some of this kind of behavior but it ties to my earlier comment about like um building a fan yes um for instance we've got we've got this uh um, chain down in australia um, they only had three stores, but they're pretty popular. Yeah. Um, and they're they're a big user of our system. Yes. And you know they have people pre-buying, 
and they have these packages that, are, that it, I, I don't I don't understand it. I think it's irrational, but they have like a um, um, and this is just dining. Now, granted, it's pro- fairly high end dining. Yes. But like who prepaid for a thousand dollar package? I'm going to go ahead and put a thousand bucks down right. that I'm going to use sometime later in the, you know, in the future. Yes. They, they do that. But <laughs> one of the interesting motivators that they also have is um, they have this private room. Yes. Um, and it's never, it's not available, period, but only to the fan base, the live and fan base. Isn't that interesting? And yeah. only available if after you've spent $20,000 with the restaurant. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and guess what? There are people working their way to aspiring to get access to the yeah. private room. Right? It's your example about the frequent flyer and all that. I mean, it's just, uh, there's something I wish I knew more about that human psychology, but there is a, a rationality um, yes. to being a fan. Well, I, I, it's interesting because the um, I, I uh, uh, when a, a friend of mine, Gary Lubman, used to be CEO of Harris, and um, when he was CEO of Harris, he taught when I was teaching at Harvard Business School. He was teaching a, a different course and brilliant labor economist and he goes over to Harris and and I was talking to him one time and he said yeah he said it's amazing he said there'll be there'll be people who own you know two or three you know G5 you know private jets and they will ask uh Gary if they can have the Harris jet or one of the Harris jets because they you know, they have a fleet of them you know that fly fly the whales right as they call them right to the yeah, yeah. casinos and um and he said it was it's a status thing, you know, it's just like, hey, I'm such a big deal at Harris. They'll um, get me in the jet. They'll get me in the jet. And um and uh and of course if you do the arithmetic, the like you have to lose a lot of money to get the jet, you know. Um and uh I I I, I did a case on um um, on Resorts International, when I was, when I was teaching Harvard Business School, we were, we were the very early days on uh, digital reward programs, and the casinos were pretty sophisticated pretty early. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I was asking the the chief marketing officer at, at uh, Resorts International in Jersey. I said, "Why does somebody come to New Jersey? You know, when they could, you know, if they have the, the, why does a high end gambler come to New Jersey when they could fly to Vegas for you know not much money or go to Monaco or wherever?" Uh, or going on a cruise ship and you know get treated like whatever. And he said, uh, he said, you know who my best customer is? I said, who? He said, my best customer is the person who is cash rich and status poor. So he said, if you look at a lot of wealthy neighborhoods, um, a lot of the professionals, consultants, doctors, lawyers, and so forth can barely kind of afford to be there. But there might be uh, a, a man or a woman who owns, you know, 12 dry cleaning places or 10 junkyards or something, and they can't get in the, and, you know, maybe they went to college, maybe they didn't, they can't get into the country club, but they could buy and sell everybody on their street yeah. from a financial standpoint. And he yeah. said, that is my customer. He said, cause they come in here and their money's green and the money's green. They get treated well. Yeah. And, you know, and so I, I, you know, when you're saying about the status thing, I think there are these other dimensions of consumption around, status and gifting and concern and badging and you know yeah. that are extremely valuable you know if if you if you if you get them right yeah um that was interesting another when you're saying about who prepay stuff I, I don't know if it's still true but uh many years ago uh, looking at the the balance sheet of um uh, walt disney company and there was an asset that was almost a billion dollars that was prepaid vacations cash yeah. you know yeah. it's, it's a beautiful thing. The uh, <clears throat> um, so, what kind of role do you think? Um, you know, the the things that you're trying to do at Live and loyalty programs, payments, and so forth um, have as we go forward, both in physical commerce, and then I don't know if you have an opinion on it, but kind of like where where do you think the metaverse is going to play in all this as we get, you know, as we get into you know fully immersive digital experiences. Interesting. Um, the, the short answer is I don't know. Um, I don't know for a couple of reasons. One is, um, I, <laughs> and this is personal, I have a little bit of a skepticism about the whole metaverse thing. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, okay. Sure. Um, in in many ways, what attracts me to live in and what we're doing with copper and all that is, it's about the physical world. Right. 
but it's harnessing the capabilities of digital that's in a virtual world, but bringing it to the physical world. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I, I personally, I prefer to go to the restaurant, not pretend to go to, to the restaurant sure. <laughs> with some goggles on and, and have a virtual experience. So, um, so I'm showing a bunch of my biases, which is a way of deflecting the answer. Of, but the reality is, I don't know. I, right. I don't know how it ties together. And I mean, certainly there are lots of smart people down the road from me who are, you know, who are putting a lot of money into into it. Um, my understanding, based on friends who work there, is, you know, even the most of the people who work there aren't all bought it. They just they just have a particular CEO that says this is it. This is the big bet. Sure. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, yes. No, no. It's interesting. I, I remember. Um, yeah, I, I too am skeptical on, on I, I think that we'll learn things in the virtual world and it will have certain things, but I, I'm, I think it's more about blended reality. You know, yeah. I, I, I totally. Mean, to be fair, as a, for instance, as a discovery and teaching tool, I think yeah. it's quite fabulous, right? If you can mm. pull the world's knowledge um, and then teach someone at least initially virtually um how to be an auto mechanic right and they can kind of play with it virtually but at some point you're gonna have to touch the car right yeah well when i was at pwc we had this wonderful thing about um reviewing people and having difficult conversations you know with yeah. employees on you know because most organizations are so bad on in performance review and yeah. very few people want to have difficult conversations and so it basically was a it was a trainer for difficult conversations with a difficult right. employee right. great right. you know great place to you know use it and 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 very convincing you know it was funny we were in a group of you know like a hundred executives and they're like oh we walked out on me you know <laughs> it was, it was yeah. fabulous yeah. anyway um well you know i mean um the very first sort of metaverse thing that came to any kind of scale. If you remember a few years back, there was a company called Second Life. Yeah, sure. Second Life. I remember, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that that was like, you're in this virtual reality universe and you're interacting sure. and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, uh, <laughs> just like most of these innovations, well, you know, they never talked about the fact that the majority of the commerce that was going on and the activity was, uh, adult related let's just say sure yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah i mean that that was that's driven a lot of the the interaction um you know innovation and then you know it's it's uh it's it was mainstream right that, yeah oh yeah 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 absolutely no uh, when we're putting a when we're doing our book on self-made billionaires we're interviewing mark cuban and he had an interesting observation. He said, look, he said, I'm not going to go start a new business. He said, but if my next business, if I, if I had the gumption to go do it, he said, I would do a personalized medicine business based on what we're, how we're treating the athletes and how we're profiling them with genetics and proteomics and the kind of food yeah. and drinks we're giving them. He said, uh, he said, that's, you know, that is to, you know, what, what uh, pornography was to second life that is to personalized medicine. Right. He, yeah. and uh, he said, cause we're right at the, you know, our, the, the health of our talent is so valuable to us that we're right at the bleeding, leading edge of understanding an application. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, then he would, he would just ride the cost curve down as he got, made it more mass market. Um, and, you know, there's a reason all Mark's a billionaire, right? He's a pretty smart dude. And um, he is a smart dude. Uh, but, you know, it helps that Yahoo wrote him a six billion dollar check for his uh, for his company. <laughs> yeah, when Yahoo they, used to be a thing. Hey, yeah, fine, whatever. Um, yeah, no, I actually had uh, Tim Brady in my first market space class. He was roommates with Yang and Philo, and uh, uh -huh. his his first uh, the first marketing plan for Yahoo he wrote as his final project for us. So yeah, that's fun. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, so uh, we haven't got a whole lot of time left. Uh, the yeah. How do you think about, I mean, I don't know if you agree. I think that this notion of really thinking through loyalty and how you can use any contact point, especially payments and points and things like that, given how competitive most businesses and categories are, is a big deal because increment, in, unless your business is really screwed up, incremental volume is always incredibly profitable. Yeah. You know, even even with high marginal cost businesses like food. Right. Yeah. The, um, so, I, I mean, what 
how do you think about it? You know, how, the, not just at live, but, you know, obviously you've been in and around the payment stuff. How should, you know, businesses think about this, especially business to consumer businesses as they go forward? Yeah. Um, well, a couple of, a couple of things. I think a broad statement would be, um, um, you're going to get to some outcome that let's I'll use the live language. Let's say I want to turn customers into fans, right? Fans are by definition from the vernacular fanatics and they're going to do all kinds of weird things and whatever else. Right. Right. In your, to your benefit. Okay. Well, how do we get them there? Um, I mean, you start with just bribing them, right? Here, here's some rewards sure. and discounts and all that. Right. Um, but I think that, when when companies particularly it's a, it's a big company capability but they don't do much about it is it's about the data right right and so i mean just to think back you know 50 years walter riston ex ceo of city that yeah. very famous thing that i still lives with me sure you know i was a you know i was barely in diapers when he said it but i read about it years later where he sure. says look one day the information about money will be worth more than the money right Right. Absolutely. So to your point about loyalty, yeah, you can bribe the guy and all that. But if you can use behavioral, you know, real reveal preference data, as the market research people would say, like yes. actual activities, like yes. I know what you ate and when and how often on the line item, things like that. Right. And then start to then put relevant things in front of you that's personalized. Right. Um, it's all possible. The tech now all exists. A lot of sure. the data is somewhat available. Um, but it's, it's really about thinking about how do I, how do I drive it down to a quote unquote network of one? Like, sure. What does John really care about? I can bribe him. I can keep giving him discounts. Right. Or, you know, that gets you into the relationship. But over time, you want to personalize that. And that's all back to like, can I be fanatical about understanding behavior and then and understanding behavior is all about how much data can I amass. Now, having said all that, you know, there's there's a bunch of regulations that have popped up starting sure. in Europe and it'll probably take some time, but it'll be in the US that um will either support that or discourage it, right? Yes. I mean it's interesting. Two things passed in Europe kind of at the same time. GDPR, <coughs> right? General mm -hmm. data protection regulation. Yes. Um, which has the harshest reset of restrictions around the world about um, protecting your privacy and your data, which, you know, in many ways, a good thing. But at the same time, they, they, they did something called PSD2, right? The Payment Service Directive updated, hence two, mm -hmm. which opened up this notion of open banking that lets third parties in and all that, right? Sure. So that, you know, more services can be delivered. And yeah. so in some ways, they, they are kind of counter to each other, but if they can coalesce how they you know, have the protections and all that, um, it starts to actually start walk your way towards, oh, okay, the moat that banks and the other people have created, because that's what you want. You want payments information, right? Right. Um, it starts to open up, and then you that informs what you can do to, to create a fan to drive more loyalty. Yeah. No, it, and, and obviously that research on, you know, fans and net promoter score and so forth, right? What, you know, Reichel did back at Bain so long ago. And then the fan research, you know, it's such a powerful, again, looking from a profitability and growth standpoint, such a powerful part of all that. And, you know, the, the I think the kind of cool, that was interesting you say about one's closing down and one's opening up. The, what I think people are missing is the fact that as we get computing, as we get computable models of cognition and computable models of social cognition, yeah. right? Okay, then um, it, then it's like the um, it's like having standard uh, anatomy, like, you know, um, yeah, I may not know. You may not know my anatomy, but you only need a small piece of me to guess at the rest. And these computable models that, you know, and, and as a marketer, all I care is statistically that it's you're useful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and so. I don't really need to know you. I just need one indicator, one jigsaw puzzle piece so I can paint you against my model. Yeah. Um, and I think those samples are, are, are propping up everywhere, right? Whether it's, you know, on the Tesla, 
you know, the Tesla cameras as they drive by me, whether it's my voice, the like work of Rita Singh at CMU, you know, I, uh, she took a 60 second voice sample from me and she was able to create um, a profile of my face, guess my age within two years, my weight within five pounds, my blood pressure within 10 points, wow. uh, personality profile, um, which I didn't look at because I didn't want to know the uh, and the <laughs> and the fact that there was something wrong with my skeleton. I've had a knee replaced all from 60 seconds of voice, uh, wow. which is. Yeah. Oh, also Caucasian, you know, and all uh, unbelievable. And um, where where I probably grew up, you know, and um, and so forth and and uh, and my likely demographic, you know, uh, financially all from 60 seconds of voice. So unbelievable. Um, <clears throat> uh, one one last thing on the on the crypto front. Um, I just wanted to crypto alternative payments, NFTs, all that other stuff. How do you? Um, I mean, you've you've seen fads come and go and so forth. And just for folks who are in the audience, uh, when Dixon says down the road, you know, he's in San Francisco, so he's talking about Silicon Valley, I believe. When you said down the road, the uh, uh, so I'm here in Chicago. Down the road would be. Indiana. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. The heart of innovation in the Midwest. There you go. Right. The uh, um, so you know, how do you think about you know crypto and alternative payments and that kind of stuff? Um. So the underlying tech, the blockchain technology, the old distributed ledger. I think um, it's once again it's early days. Right. Um. But there's something potentially powerful in it right there's a right. Um, it's um efficient and so forth um crypto as it as i think just and i'm no expert by any means and, sure. and i haven't gotten involved in it purposely just because um you know i think it is it has been a little bit of a fad um but you know change change the labeling and i mean in some ways we're not doing anything different in in liven you know it's a token it's a it's a metaphor for value it just happens to be in in the case of crypto expressed in, in you know in this you know in in this coin that mm -hmm. you know has to go through all the cryptography and 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 um and computation i mean frankly when you think about it it's an incredibly inefficient payment system yeah right um you know it, it it's consuming way too much computational power so that's a that has a bad um you know sort of um ecology effect sure um and it's slow right um but for certain kinds of transactions or, or i should say back to the you know the idea of a smart contract and instantiating um all sorts of terms around at a transaction level that's that's been hard to do with current technology so you know as that evolves i think there's something to it um awesome. but you know right now it's i frankly i my personal opinion i i think it's still the whole crypto thing is still in the world of speculators right right now, no surprise you know as these markets melt down you know sure the majority of the money that's going into these exchanges and the cryptos are actually the institutional investors on wall street right yeah. so it's not like you know um, you know, some nerdy kid who's like doing an interesting thing. And it's because it's it's you know it's like all speculation. You know, if there's if there's a hedge and if there's something to be made from it, but I think that's all it is. Yeah, fascinating. Well, Dixon, I want to thank you so much. And I just you know, in terms of you know, as people think about things and they're thinking about loyalty and payments and you know, decreasing the friction in commerce. You know, I certainly. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I offer that, you know, yeah, I'm here. have a conversation yeah. and so forth. And then um, it's great to see you as always looking, looking well. And uh, thanks so yeah, much, yeah. Uh, both for Manifold and my crew here and for our audience. So thanks, Dixon, for taking the time. All right. I'm glad to do it. I'm honored. Um, I just wanted to do a rest of the story piece um, here where we've got uh, the Magstripe um uh, on the cards that the credit cards we have, they're now getting replaced by the, you know, by the um, chip. Uh, interesting. There's a guy named Forrest Perry, and uh, he was a uh, he was the first one invented. He was working for the CIA, trying to give the data onto a plastic card. And his trick was he his problem was he couldn't figure out how to get the magnetic tape onto the back of the card. And he was discussing this thing over dinner with his wife, and she said, "Why don't you try ironing it on?" 
And sure enough, that's how he did it. And that was the beginning of the mag stripe as we know it today. Um, we believe in a um, um, share and share alike strategy here. So all of this stuff is under um, a Creative Commons license. And if you want to have any of the information that's here uh, or any of our other information that we have published, um, it's all under the Creative Commons license of uh, you're welcome to reuse it. Just uh, say uh, refer to you know where you got it from if you take a you know a good hunk of of the information just as you do in any reference, and uh, our passion is really to figure out disruptive technologies and so if you are dealing with um, disruption, dematurity, new forms, new competitors, new growth, uh, we just love that. That's what you know we wake up every day to do. So it's a pleasure having you all here. Thanks again, Dixon, and hope to see you all next month. Thank you.